Welcome to AI for Good, the leading action-oriented, global and inclusive United Nations platform on AI. Organized by ITU, in partnership with 40 UN sister organizations, and co-convened with Switzerland. The goal of AI for Good is to identify practical applications of AI to advance the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and scale those solutions for global impact. In today's session, we're counting on you to use the live video wall feature to ask questions and post comments to help create an engaging discussion. We encourage you to stay until the end to chat, connect, ask questions, and network with our distinguished panelists and world-class AI experts in the neural network. It is now time to kick off the session and welcome our first speaker. The floor is yours. Thank you, Anna. A welcome and a good morning, a good afternoon and a good evening. And I do hope this was an inclusive welcome as possible today, given today's topic is AI and inclusion. Now, AI has the great potential to deliver an inclusive society. However, it does put pressure on AI itself as access to digital technologies is not a level playing field. So today we're gonna to talk about AI algorithms, data, conditions, programming, diversity, and the message we need to take. I'd like to welcome uh, the panel, which will cover these topics. Uh, and the panel consists of Kay Firth Butterfield. She's the head of the artificial intelligence and member of the executive committee of the World Economic Forum. We have Ria Persat, currently CEO and founder of Statwater with over 30 years of AI experience and is one of the founders of machine learning. Last but not least, Princess Laurentine from Oranje of the Netherlands, who is a social entrepreneur and the founder of the Number Five Foundation. And I'm your host, Fritz Bussemaker, chair of the Institute for Accountability in the Danish Age. If you want to more, know more about the panel members, uh, please go to the AI for, AI for Good website. Then you can have your full, uh, you could say, bio available. Now, before we go to the panel discussion, I am honored and happy to introduce Chase Lee. He's one of uh, the member of ITU's leadership team who will present the welcome remarks for today's sessions. Now, Briefly introduce Jacob. He was elected as the director of ITU's Telecom Standardization Bureau in uh, 2014 in Busan, uh, Korea, and for a four-year period that was extended for a second four-year period at the next conference in Dubai. Now he's contributed to the ICT standardization for over 30 years, started off his professional life as a researcher at the Korea Telecom after 17 years, moved to the Electronics Telecommunications Research Institute and the Korea Advanced Institute for Science and Technology. So, an established uh, speaker. So, Chesup, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Fritz. Uh, Princess Laurentian, and the Kai Forest, Butterfield, Ria Prasad, Fritz Bosmark, and the colleagues and the friends. Uh, very good day. I really welcome all of you for this very important session today. Uh, my great pleasure to welcome you to our discussion. I thank you all very much for joining us. Uh, inclusion and equality are among the most important challenges facing humanity today. AI has become a symbol of our hopes as well as fears for our high-tech future. Advances in AI have reinvigorated global debate around what it means to the human and what it means to be human. The questions raised by AI are asking us how we plan to live together harmoniously as an interconnected global society. As AI helps to automate and increase the inclusivity of services in areas such as healthcare, financial services, and education, we must take care to ensure that AI generated decisions do not reinforce existing inequalities. And of course, access to AI is the precondition for beneficial AI. So we approach today's discussions with the recognition that AI has extraordinary potential to act as a force for good, but also with the recognition that this will demand extensive international cooperation to achieve a more equitable distribution of AI and its benefits. So inclusion is at the heart of AI for good. 
supported by the year round AI for Good digital platform, the AI for Good movement continues to grow stronger, becoming even more inclusive and more scalable towards global impact. IQ standardization world receives valuable support from the AI for Good digital platform. It drives inclusive dialogue that helps to clarify the contributions expected of all stakeholders, including the contributions expected of IT. I'd also like to make particular mention of ITU's AI challenges, competitions where anyone can participate to solve problem statements related to communication networks or geospatial data analysis. These competitions have welcomed around 3,000 participants over three editions, with more than half of the participants being students. These competitions are a highly practical approach to stimulating global access to AI expertise and capabilities. Some of the problem statements apply IQ standards for machine learning with the effect of enhancing the skill sets of the next generation of AI innovators, as well as their ability to contribute to IQ standardization work. I'd like to put now some of challenge for you the panel and the audience. Over three decades ago, IQ defined the term called quality of service, which describes the overall performance of a service in communication network and the systems and attempts to measure it objectively through parameters such as response time, echo, loudness levels, and many others. Around a decade ago, ITO adopted the definition of quality of experience, which describes the degree of uh, delight or annoyance of the user of an application or service. So whereas quality of service measurements are in general not related to the customer, but to the network or systems, quality, experience, quality of experience is a purely subjective measure from the user's perspective. So my challenge, my question is, can you define something similar to quality of service or quality of experience also in the field of AI so that we arrive at practical guidelines that engineers can use to implement their AI powered products to fit such guidance such as quality of service or quality of experience for AI neutrality performance. What does it take to get us there? So ITU's global membership included 193 member states and over 900 companies, universities, and international and regional organizations. So I, our work is driven by your contributions and the consensus decisions. So all participants' voices are heard and so I urge you to make your voice known. So um, uh, I wish uh, this uh, session will try to challenge how this I2 standard will uh, move forward or provide practical information, useful information to AI communities. So thank you very much. Please. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, Dr. Lee, dear Chairship, thank you so much for your uh, welcome remarks and the challenge. Uh, this is a session about inclusivity. That does mean uh, we want to have as much audience participation as possible. So uh, as mentioned, uh, if you have any questions uh, during uh, the presentations, because we're going to first hear from the three panel members, uh, please already put them on the neural network so we can discuss them. So again, uh, Chase, thank you so much for your contribution. And uh, allow me to move on to the first panel member, uh, Kay Firth Butterfield. Kurth, uh, Kay, thank you so much for joining us. Um, now, I already mentioned uh, that you are a, an executive member of the World Economic Forum, uh, but also a barrister, former judge, and professor, technologist, entrepreneur, and uh, I think the, the world's first AI ethics officer. So the person to talk to in this case. Um, 
where do we start? Where do we begin? Well, I think what we have to do is begin to see this as a, well, I would say, because I think about responsible AI all the time, I actually think of inclusion as just one segment of getting AI right. And so I think we would start there. So I would say that anything that you are doing in the creation of artificial intelligence, you need to get it right, right from the beginning. And that includes this inclusion topic. But I actually do think that there's a wider issue here, and that's the geopolitical issue. And because we can't be truly inclusive until we are sure that everybody in the world has access to these um, AI tools and say, you know, what do we need for that? Well, we need some infrastructure. We need good energy resources everywhere. We need good internet access everywhere because otherwise conversations we're having are frankly moot in a lot of countries. And so we have to really think, think inclusion through from the, from the very bottom. Also, I would say we need to think, we need to start having a debate about AI sustainability um, and how we make sure that we factor in making our AI sustainable as well. And of course, the other structural problem that I would raise is the education piece. Um, it is really important that all countries don't just depend upon the big companies that we're seeing in the global north for the way that they think about AI and the way that they use AI, but also create educational uh, uh, opportunities that allow for um, country, in-country, um, inclusive design of AI. Uh, okay, I understand your wish to um, um, go for inclusivity by design uh, and make the right choice. But first of all, then, who determines what's right or not? And maybe secondly, how do you enforce it? <laughs> well, that's a, that's a big question about, you know, do we need global ethical rules or responsible AI rules, or do we need local re responsible AI rules as well? And I would say that we need both. Um, having worked in this sector for, well, since it, since it was very few of us thinking about this, um, I've, I, you know, I've always said that what we need is both. Um, unfortunately, we have lots and lots of principles, I think 192 and counting, um, but we are not so doing so well at internationally creating, you know, putting those principles into practice because everybody does come from different places. They come from different cultures. They have different values. And so, um, that's one of the reasons that I say not only do we need the ITU and the forum's efforts and everybody else's efforts at a global level, but we also need a national effort as well. Can and you give so us examples? One, Has that already, I mean, uh, are you aware of examples where that already, okay, good, because I want to know if we can learn from <laughs> others here. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's always important not to just say things, but also give examples of what people might do. So one of the things that we did very early in my tenure at the forum is actually say, what, what are the things that would make a difference on a glo truly global scale? And that actually is something that you can do nationally. So think of, uh, so governments can really think about how they design their procurement of AI pr processes. And um, they can use our toolkit, and several countries have, or they can use others that are out there. But the main things I think that are important to remember here is that there's a lot of government money going into AI. So what that means is that they can be very influential. The second thing is that um, if they really want to make sure that you've got inclusive design, then they can um, adjust who they procure from. Many governments will only procure from big companies and it takes years and years to actually go through the procurement process. We Governments need to be much more agile about that and also recognize that 
some of their homegrown startups might actually be better and um, uh, at at providing the services that they need internally. So you need to tweak the process of your procurement. I think the other thing that's really important here is that you can then say to the people bidding for the contracts, you have to have include, you have to have responsible AI. And I would say that includes inclusive AI. And you can actually teach your procurement folks to look for that and 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 really make sure that you have got that embedded at the very earliest opportunity into what you're procuring and i would say that that is as not as good as re re regulation in all cases but it's a really good place yeah. to start because we know that ai is moving really quickly and here you've got a form of soft soft govern governance which governments can use to say this is the bar for inclusion and responsible ai that i want you to jump companies okay now uh, so this is what uh, on the procurement side but once you have uh, an engine um you know in order to get that engine uh, to work correctly the ai uh, it, it, i mean this is also a discussion not just not just about the engine uh, the algorithm it's also about how you train that engine, how do you, how you educate that. So it's about the data. So uh, any comments on that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that we find when working with many companies, with many countries, yeah. is that um, we could provide a service, but they don't have digitalized records. And therefore, there is no data um, to actually um, produce a, an algorithm or a service. For them. So the very first starting point for most countries is get your data in order, get it in a form that's machine readable, and, um, and make sure that that data is inclusive. You know, we all know that there are lots of biases <laughs> that we can, we can bring in through the data. So there's a whole process to go through. Um, but the start for many, many countries, sadly, is just that they don't have machine readable data. And on that, I just want to, uh, I don't know if you read the Bianchi et al um, paper on generative AI and how that's um, also uh, amplifying demographic stereotypes already. And I think that we, we should not forget when we're in this conversation about data and AI, the metaverse because we need to get inclusion right now because otherwise millions, billions of people will be left out of the metaverse, which is coming for us very soon. Great. Hey, uh, Kay, for now, uh, some very uh, interesting first thoughts and ideas, how we can get, make AI inclusive in order for it itself to be inclusive. Uh, if I may, audience, I'm gonna to move to our second panel member and get uh, a different perspective how we're going to tackle this. And I'm going to do that with Ria Persad. Ria, hey, welcome to the panel. Uh, as mentioned, founder of Statwater, ranked the number one climate tech by the Environmental Business International. So uh, well done there. Thank uh, you. You have over 30 years experience in AI, founders of machine learning, as mentioned. Uh, and you also, um, you could say, use your knowledge to help support uh, young people in their journey. Question, same question to you actually, as for Kay, where do you start? Where, what should we do? Well, I resonate with the points that Kay made, which is the combination of having some type of um, global, whether it's governance or best practices that can be used for inclusive rules and systems, because this is a new area for a lot of organizations. And so it's really helpful to have some type of standardization, some type of guidelines that we can all follow. At the same time, AI in its implementation is essentially a computer program. It's not really very intelligent at all. Mm -hmm. And so what I'd like to emphasize is that no matter what system we decide to implement, I always say that we need that human touch or the human component. 
And I've seen this so many times in organizations where I've been brought in to help build their team, where we have these HR types of systems and very sophisticated AI algorithms to sort through hundreds and thousands of applicants. And we get it wrong. <laughs> okay. And many times we have to go okay. through. Yeah. So how do we get it wrong? Well, Sorry. what happens is that the computer program might filter out excellent, excellent candidates just because certain words aren't there or just because it just isn't identifying excellence or it's not able to identify certain types of trends. If we're trying to diversify in certain types of roles, it can't seem to understand how are we, you know, what does that really mean? And so the computer program is only as good as the intelligence of the software development that went behind it. Okay, so your point is we are not ready yet to automate automation. I think we, we do our best to automate automation, but it will not be fully automated. And okay. so that's where we need very skillful and, uh, and very well-informed people on diversity and inclusion on our teams to be able to vet these systems and to work hand in hand with these systems to see that um, to see that we don't have people falling through the cracks. Yeah. So in your point, um, what does this mean? What's your advice uh, for the development team and the people setting up the development team? I think that you know, thinking of AI as just this automation and we're just fully automated, certainly it can automate. 90% of our tedium. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to these types of rules and systems where we need to have a very careful touch, where it's not necessarily just a machine saying yes or no, it's more complex. There are more exceptions. There is more maybe creativity in the process. That's where we really need people. We really need people who are very well educated on the, in the diversity and inclusion subject area on our teams who can help to inform this. And that can include also people who themselves are a part of the community of women and minorities. It's wonderful to have systems that are built by people who are going to experience those systems. Okay. And I think that that's very important. Uh, yeah. Uh, so when you, the, the way you talk about inclusion, uh, to me, it sounds like it's also embracing diversity. Yes, I believe inclusion is also embracing diversity, diversity of all kinds. And we're never going to really have all of the rules in place that can identify every single special case that's out there. And so I think that, you know, the human brain is still a lot more complex than any computer program. The human eye is still a lot more sensitive than any neural network. And even over at NASA, we know this, I've worked over there. We, I, I was a space physicist at NASA. And even to this very day, if we're trying to find galaxies or supernova or whatever, we, we run through AI, but then we have human beings actually set their eyes on those photographs to try to find these things in terms of these crowdsourced data because we're just not there yet. There are things that the computer simply cannot do. And okay. so I think that humans are essential. Okay. You also ask, actually has given us a reality check. I mean, uh, the, the, the long-term vision of what it could be, that's, that's awesome. Uh, but where we are today, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. And so when we have these systems where people are getting left out, I mean, I've gotten left out in application systems where, you know, it just didn't catch me, even though I thought, well, my goodness, I just filled in all the blanks and check, check, check. But yet somehow this computer system left me out. So I've experienced it myself actually many times. And so I think that's where uh, we just need to be very sober about the state of technology. Great. Hey, Ria, uh, for now, I want to thank you for your input so far. And I've already seen that the first two panel members have raised the first questions in our chat. So definitely, once we've, uh, we're done with introducing the last panel member, we'll go to this chat. So please uh, help these uh, get these uh, questions coming in. Thank you so much. And this allows me to introduce our third 
panel member, Princess Laurentine of the Netherlands. Uh, Laurentine, welcome. I am going to provide a disclaimer to the audience. You are not an AI expert. I realize, and we're both out of our depth because we just see that we're talking to global AI experts with true rocket science but you have a very different and very important perspective on this topic as an outsider. So what's your first thoughts when you hear these discussions so far? So, well, first of all, I'm, uh, I'm learning a lot, um, uh, human learning. And um, while I was listening, a number of things actually come to mind. Um, one is, and I think it touches on the points that Kay and Ria actually uh, mentioned, so I'm not so far off, but maybe I take it to a more radical stage from the, from the daily reality that I'm working on, which is that I work with totally excluded people mm -hmm. or normal citizens. Now, that sounds like a contradiction, but what I do is I work with people who, through the biases and through the discriminations of the systems, Algorithms were created. And in the Netherlands, we have a terrible case where basically 40,000 citizens were done wrong by through this algorithm that the government built. 100,000 children have been ruined in their lives for the last 15 years. It's a well known case in the Netherlands. So, one, a few thoughts that come to mind. Um, I believe that the currently, the way that we have organized the top-down approach of be it companies or governments, we are we have decision-making processes very much from ivory towers. So the disconnect between the ivory towers and the real lives of people in uh, in countries is so enormous that if you don't understand what the real realities are, and for me, there's only one reality and that's daily life of real people. Um, if that disconnect is there, the bias will always be there. I find that in my work, diversity, inclusion, um, participation are very much kind of um, uh, checks uh, on a list. Yeah not a fundamental mindset shift of, of realization that you have a bias because you are in the ivory tower. And so I think a lot needs to be done. It's interesting that both Kay and Ria, they start, they, they mentioned the word humans, but you also, your starting points are rules and um, agreements. But in the end, it is humans who define algorithms. So if the ivory towers don't have even either an interest or a, an idea what daily lives are of a huge amount and a range of citizens, and this is terrible, unfortunately the case, then how are you gonna break through that vicious circle of bias and discrimination? And it is not by hiring more consultants who also are living in ivory towers who are also disconnected from daily lives. So I think that if we don't tackle this at source, I'm a great fan of David Bohm, who said you can never solve a problem downstream, then you'll never get the right algorithms. So I am a strong proponent that we tackle diversity and inclusion and so on much more deeply. Um, yeah, and, and addressing the, the blockages in ivory towers. Okay, so now thank you for your opening remarks, Laurentin. Um, okay, that, that, that's actually um, a remark. I, I first want to come back to the other panel members. So hopefully we can get them to turn on uh, their mics and the video again. Because I, before we go to the audience questions, Kay, Ria, are you in an ivory tower? Yeah, probably we are in an ivory tower. But I have to say that what um, the princess has just said is one of the things that keeps me up at night because uh, we all know that the benefits from artificial intelligence are myriad, but um, we need to conquer the issues around AI in order to find those benefits. And um, we need to build trust amongst citizens because what we are seeing, particularly in the global north in the latest Edelman study, 
is that um, actually the, the general public do not trust what we are doing in AI. And frankly, I don't blame them because we haven't explained it properly. And so people find the, you know, people, people see the problems and they don't, and in many cases, rightly, they know that we're not doing enough. So I, I agree with, with, her, with the princess yeah. totally. Okay. Um, and so what I think we should be doing is we should be doing a better job of educating people. There is no, no point in asking people their view about something if it's something that they don't understand. And then I can come back to some ideas about how we can tackle that diversity issue at the at the uh, the beginning level of algorithms. But I want to hand on to Ria. Uh, well, before Ria, because I, I saw uh, Laura Thien raise her hand uh, virtually. Very good. Uh, so our first reaction before we get Ria's response. So. Um, so first of all, Kay, I feel that we have an allyship um, uh, that is starting here in this uh, in this platform, and and uh, that really uh, because I believe in allyship. Um, two thoughts from let's say reality about the notion of trust. Um, but again, I'm I, I believe in allyship, so I'm not saying I don't agree because I don't believe in that. I believe in dialogue and we build on each other, but. From my reality, uh, on a daily basis, sort of connecting the ivory towers and and the non-ivory towers, um, is that what I see happening is that the ivory towers are trying to build trust. To be honest, unfortunately, we are beyond that point. You cannot build, the ones who have lost the trust can never be the ones building the trust. Because trust is something that is needs to rise above from the people who've lost the trust. So the way that I work, for example, the vic with the victims, the tens of thousands of victims in, in this situation we are talking about in the Netherlands, um, uh, I'm helping them that they need to start trusting. And the only way that you can start trusting is not to be told, okay, believe in what I'm proposing you, it's because the ivory towers are no longer trusted. So the only way is that in neutral spaces, the trust can be spilled, it can be built. And the second thing is that the only way why they have people lost trust is because the ivory towers have not listened to those voices. And because we haven't listened, and we haven't really soaked up the thoughts and the challenges and the issues that people are living in their daily lives, we are perhaps building the wrong algorithms. So the only way is that the ivory towers need to start listening. But the vicious circle is, is that, that I keep talking about these ivory towers, don't know what questions to ask. So I think that I see that the ivory towers are often asking all the wrong questions in order to get the right insights from, let's say, the undercurrent of society. So a neutral space can actually help build the right questions, and then you can start re-energizing, let's say, the, the, you break through that vicious circle. Okay. Uh Thank you for your first uh, reply, uh, uh, Laurentine. But also, I want to come back to Ria. Uh, I saw you nodding. So assuming you agree with what's been said so far. Absolutely. I think that Princess Laurentine has brought forward a very major issue, not just for AI, but it's a cautionary tale for other areas as well, as we're trying to solve the climate crisis as well, mm -hmm. which is that we really need collaboration, communication, and representation. And so we need to work together, as Laurentine has said, but also there needs to be that kind of clear communication. And also those people to whom these policies will affect, they need to be represented in this discussion. They need to be invited into these discussions. 
And that's not easy. It's the same thing that, you know, that we saw at, at COP27. We need collaboration, we need communication, and we need representation by those whom it affects. And so it becomes a matter of people really learning to, just as Laurentine said, people learning to listen together and also inviting those people to the table to whom it really matters the most. And I think that that, that will help in terms of our compass on a practical level. And it also is a kind of a, a checkup and even a moral compass as well. Great. Hey, thank you so far. Um, now, um, Kay, uh, Kay, I see you. Do, do you want to react to this question? Otherwise, I'm going to move to our uh, um, audience to include them as well in our discussion. Yeah, I just wanted to add that, you know, governments have a real responsibility here because they are the elected um, officials by people. And so um, if they are not doing anything to protect their citizens, then they need to be doing something in this area. I agree entirely that we need to have everybody involved and we need to build ways that we can talk to every, to one another. But if you don't actually, if you don't, if your government's not even representing you in this conversation, then that's a, that, that's a starting point. And it's also why in the Edelman study, it says that true uh, that trust in government is also getting worse. And one, one thing I just wanted to throw out there is, you know, the government of Finland has um, produced a course that everybody can take on AI so that everybody feels empowered to actually take on this conversation that we need to be having. Okay. So the, the, there are, uh, you could say, uh, options out there to educate yourself, which is, I think we already covered that weather, um, today, which is needed to provide that trust and that transparency. Um, now, somewhere in the discussion so far, it triggered a question from one of the audience members, uh, which is actually related to trust. And that is, yeah, we, we want the system to be inclusive and, um, like I say, cope with, um, uh, cater for uh, diversity. But how can we verify the AI results to be accurate and unbiased? Um, and will it ever be unbiased? Um, okay. Do you have an answer yeah. to that? <laughs> yeah, sure. I'm sorry. Uh, um, yes. So um, sometimes we want these systems to be biased um, because if, for example, you are trying to tackle a particular health issue, you actually want the system to be biased towards the people, the population whose health you are supposed to be um, uh, uh, curing. So, you know, there is absolutely no point if we go back to data in providing data on a lot of um, white Americans if, a if something that you're trying to cure is actually um, only prevalent in the African-American population, for example. So sometimes we do want biased data. And I think it's really important and it's part of the education piece that we should be thinking about. But generally, we don't want bias data because of the diversity and inclusion issues. And so um, at the moment, how do we do it? I would say that we have to think about responsible AI by design. We have to make sure that there are diverse teams thinking about this at the very beginning. So what we know is that a lot of these teams tend to be male and tend to be of a certain age. It's neat. Lovely to see Ria here because it's not it's not common. And so, when someone's designing an algorithm for somebody who's white and old and female like me, then probably they're not going to design a good algorithm for me because they don't have they don't have my perspective. And so, making that diversity of team, and that's actually where we could begin to think about bringing Laurentines you know, who are the people you're building for into that conversation? And um, then at the other end, of course, we are seeing all over the place um, companies setting up to test algorithms. And I um, 
And that in itself has potential problems because, you know, this is the ivory tower, um, to use that metaphor, testing the ivory tower. Um, but I saw that the person came from Canada and I just wanted to say that there is some really good work being done in Canada and by a nonprofit called the Responsible AI Institute. Um, and so, you know, we are actually seeing not only commercial verification, but also nonprofit verification as well. Okay. Hey, thank you. Uh, again, Laurentine, you raise your hand. Well, just uh, maybe to add on to that, um, uh, and it's really interesting listening to, to the language. So one, one is the language of, you know, the system is inclusive. I think that also the video that opened this session was really about AI for good. And the way that I translate it in the world that I live and the way the work that I do is all about system change. A system is there to protect the status quo. And I believe that if you can start designing, this is why the revolutionary way approach from the bottom up, um, that's why I talk about this allyship. If you can actually, you need a revolution from below to arch, actually start challenging the status quo. And if you take, bring in the bottom and the top and you make sure that the translation is done properly from below to what then needs to happen that um, uh, of how to how to design then systems then it works what i see happen is that systems are so resistant of challenging the status quo that they keep that and that's why i i'm a little bit concerned about the word representation because very often representation is again a check in the box and say, okay, we've heard to that voice, now let's go on to the status quo. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm slightly more radical um, uh, in that, that I say that if you, that if the AI people learn, and that is a skill, that is not a given, learn to ask the right questions, but also learn how to translate the insights that you get from the bottom in the right way, you can actually start delivering on the promise of being a force for good but if you if you skip that element you start thinking as the system and top down in the ivory tower you won't even hear what people are saying from 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 let's say bottom up and so i think the translation role this is often where it goes wrong and if we do that then people will say ah we've listened to this 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 group but they actually haven't listened because they've just listened in the, the tunnel vision of, uh, of what you, you're, you've been defending for many years. So I think that there is really a radical change that we need to start uh, working on. Great. Ria. Thank you very much. I really appreciate these points that both Kay and Laurentine have made. I'd like to just add a very interesting statistic in terms of building more diversity onto our teams. So machine learning and artificial intelligence, people who design these algorithms in many cases might have a statistics or mathematics background. And the majority of statisticians are actually women. And women have earned over 40% of math and statistics bachelor's degrees in the last 40 years. And so, I just wanted to put that out there that it is actually possible <laughs> to build out diverse teams. It really is possible. And there are lists and things out there. You can contact me if you'd like, you know, big dictionaries of who these women actually are, <laughs> if you'd like to build on your team. But at any rate, I'd like to point, or I'd like to um, illustrate another way that we can eliminate bias in our systems. And it's something borrowing from what we do in climate science. So what do we do with the IPCC report or with the CMIP climate models is we get, we bring on different models and different consensus models. The climate change, you know, um, kind of conclusions that are set forth in the IPCC is the result of 
really hundreds of models coming together. Because if you just say, well, this here we have the one model for this very important thing, that model will have biases, but then somebody else's model will have biases too, but they might be different biases. And so, you know, bringing together all of this knowledge, bringing together different systems in a type of a consensus modeling, it's, 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 it's a mathematical technique, but it kind of, you know, when you bring together all of these different so-called voices or computer voices <laughs> and different perspectives, different developers and programmers, then we have, we, we can actually in, in a more automated way, actually eliminate some of that bias. And that's what we do in climate modeling. Good. I, I want to pick up on a question that actually I, a point that I wanted to make on the notion of diversity. And I'm seeing a question by Jacob Willem Brown about how has communication between ivory tower specialists and the greater populace been improved before? Are there historical examples, branches that have done it well? And actually, interestingly, maybe we should start um, creating broader debates about what do we mean by what 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 is our view on diversity and very often we think of men and women and people from different cultural backgrounds and i think we need to go into different um people who have different perspectives on the reality of life and the case that i'm working on which is um uh, what i just mentioned in the netherlands really shows that there is a deeper refinement of how we look at diversity. And it brings me to the question of, have there been interesting um, uh, notions of this um, <clears throat> ivory tower and the populace? We have to think perhaps of trade unions. Trade unions, interestingly, have been formed where there is a collective voice from people who were unheard, not put aside, and they started creating a more collective voice, starting to connect with the ivory towers, literally, and the directors in companies. And I think that if you start deeper listening, um, and I have a whole methodology and process for that, to start deeper listening about the different layers of people's lives, and you start capturing that refinement, reading in between the lines, I always call it, and you bring that to the um, uh, high flying uh, and, and very and sort of knowledgeable and, and uh, brainy people behind AI, then you really start to have magic. But I think that as long as we don't capture the, the magic from everyday life at, in all layers, we will always remain too artificial, superficial in, in what we capture from the, let's say the populace. But I believe that trade unions are interesting examples historically of, of connecting top down and bottom up. Thank you. Okay, do you have any examples in this case for this question? Uh, yes, but I think the trade union example is the best one I've heard. So, um, because my, I, I, it immediately occurred to me because we're talking about inclusion and diversity, that you know the American civil rights movement um, is definitely an example of grassroots change. Um, but uh, that that caused a lot of loss of life and a lot of pain. So that's why I much like the much more prefer the trade union example in this case. Um, I do think that I am beginning to see that companies see it as a market issue. And so, you know, companies create things so that they can sell them, essentially. And um, if they can't sell them because they are biased or, diver or not, uh, lack diversity and things like that, then maybe the market itself will see some change. Um, I know that that might be a wishful thinking, but I'm going to throw it out there anyway. Um, and and it does actually give hum give humans us as citizens the opportunity to to vote with our feet. If we don't like the service that's being given to us, we can stop having that service. But in some cases, you just can't because you can't live without being on the internet, for example. Um, and then the third thing I was going to say, because I think it's important to remember. Back in 2014, when I was the world's first chief AI ethics officer, 
we didn't really have a movement around responsible AI. We didn't have these conversations at all. Um, I started some work with the IEEE in 2015. There were 15 of us, of which most of us uh, were not actually AI scientists. We all brought those very different nuanced perspective to it. Yes, we all came from the ivory tower, but we, we came to it saying something has to be done. And now we're having these conversations. And so I, 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 you know, I think that we should at least smile that we've come so, so far so quickly, even if we've got a long way to go. Wow. Okay, uh, hey, we're down in the last 10 minutes before we're going to move to the neural network. So we're almost ready for your uh, final takeaways. And so far, I'm very happy that we've been very much talking about the human side, getting the right people involved when we are addressing this. So it's not being biased or unbiased. It has to be relevant for the, the issue. That's my takeaway so far from all your feedback. Um, well, uh, in all inclusiveness, uh, this means transparency. So we have a couple of questions from the audience. I also want to uh, bring to you, see if we, if we can uh, discuss that. Um, um, I'm assuming the answer is yes to Julian Beltran's question is, uh, if we say technology is inclusive, um, um, how do we uh, cope with engineers with a disability? Um, yeah, I was just going to come and answer yeah, yeah, that yeah. for it, if, yeah. if it's useful. Yeah. Um, I think the way that I see it is that there are many types of disabilities. So there, there's mental disability, there's um, physical disability, there's emotional disabilities, but there's also just being too young to give your consent and too old to give your consent. And increasingly, we are seeing algorithm uh, AI product that's, um, that, that is actually about selling to children or selling to other people. Um, and one of the things that I find encouraging um, is the work that's being done by UNICEF around children and the, the use of AI and how it can benefit them and how, what the problems are. And also the work that the UN High Commissioner on Human Rights have been doing around uh, AI and persons with disabilities. Uh, what we're not seeing, and I think we will see, is as um, AI-enabled devices help us when we're old, um, there, is, there is some work done around, you know, how do people with dementia consent? And some of those, those big social topic issues that we just have to get our yeah. minds around. Yeah. And by the way, as mentioned by Ria, I mean, uh, the way you approach that, that's not just restricted to AI, AI that actually applies to any system we're delivering. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, hey, we're, as mentioned, unfortunately, we're almost at the top of the hour. So what I'm going to do in, in a reverse order from the panel is invite you to uh, present some closing statements. What's the big takeaway from this discussion as far as you're concerned? What does your ideal work uh, world look like in the future? Uh, what do you want the audience to think about or start thinking about? Laurentine, can I invite you to provide your final input? Well, I guess I think what, first of all, I really enjoyed this discussion and, um, uh, and thank you for sticking with me as a non-AI specialist and, and including me. So I feel very included from my um, uh, from my perspective, from another space, uh, another spot in in yeah. space, let's say, um, then perhaps the the so a complementary spot, and uh, and I really appreciate it, and you really sort of started opening my mind, um, and I think we should take this conversation further. So that's really first my first takeaway, um, and I think I guess what is really my top line is that. Definitions matter. Definitions matter about um, uh, who defines diversity, who defines inclusion, who defines um, uh, is AI for people or is people, people for AI? And it's really ultimately all about um, uh, the way that we 
that we look at, and maybe this sounds very grand, sort of the universe. So, so who, who defines who's at the center of the universe? It's almost like Copernicus. Um, uh, is it, is it uh, the sun or is it earth? And I think that we're at a transition in time when we see that so many big systems are faltering, that now is the time to start afresh of how and not taking a little bit of the status quo to the next phase in the transition, but really dare to look at very radical eyes to the next, how we're going to fix some of these systems. And I feel that too often we say we talk about systems change, but do we dare to go deep enough in, in the radical uh, perspective change? in order to start rethinking of some of the new systems. And I have started to realize in this conversation to close that AI could be a leverage and a catalyst to really do things deeply different as long as the AI people don't fall into the same trap of the ivory towers from the past. And um, you've really, yeah, given me some energy to perhaps start connecting uh, on this. Hey, so Laura, thank you. Can realize with the, the platform we are is ITU's AI for good. So this is a global platform. This is the place to present that big, hairy, audacious goal. So you've done that. Thank you. Thank Ria. You. Thank you very much, Fritz. I just want to thank the other presenters, Princess Laurentine and Kay, for such deep insights. And I think that what we've uncovered here is really the depth of the topic. It goes much beyond just a few talking points. And I love that point that Laurentine brought up about challenging the status quo. And it really directs us to the point that if we want to see systems change, it's really about elevating our consciousness. Do we want change? And do we really care about other people and diversity and inclusion? And it becomes a very human issue. And as Kay also brought forward, this is about human rights as well. And so, you know, we talk about AI, we talk about all of these technicalities, but ultimately, and it's the same thing with climate as well. If we want to bring about change, there's also a, it's like a cultural revolution. It's, it's elevating our thinking, our philosophy. This is really what underlies all of these kinds of rules and systems that we're trying to set up. What are our belief systems about other people who are different from us? And how, you know, do we really mean it? And then I think that, you know, if, if, we're, if our hearts are in the right place and if we can get like-minded on some of these um, philosophies about what we want to accomplish for the collective good, I think that that can definitely fuel and propel forward and provide the basis for our rules-based systems. Hey, uh, Ria, thank you for your takeaways and also your questions. Those are big cliffhangers. And I know that the AI for Good team wants to continue this discussion in the future uh, as this topic is very relevant, as Trisha pointed out, for the fundamental of providing AI for Good. So uh, I think those qu cliffhanger questions, we will cover them in a future session. But thank you so far for your takeaways. Okay. Oh, gosh. Well, um, yes, I, I think for me, the the, one of the takeaways is what Florentine said about systems change. Um, I, I worry about the fact that whether it's possible to achieve, given the fragmentation that we're seeing, the political fragmentation we are seeing in countries around the world. And so if we want to see it, then we do have to work together and we have to work together urgently. And we're saying we should have solved these problems 10 years ago. Um, so, so yes, that, so that's one takeaway for me. Um, let's, let's, let's continue the conversation. I think the other thing for me is that, you know, this is also structural. Um, we can't have these conversations in a realistic way unless we include the Global South and we're not including the Global South because of the energy and the internet and the lack of funding, frankly, from, from the Global North going into the Global South so that they can reap the benefits of it. And so I think that if we were going to take two challenges forward, 
One would be how do we actually think about system change and so to change and work for inclusion. And the other would be how do we actually include the half of the world that we don't include at the moment? That's, uh, I'd say, a second very big, hairy, audacious goal to achieve, making certain that discussion is going to be inclusive. If it's not inclusive, AI and inclusion will never happen. So uh, we've reached the top of the hour. I want to thank the panel members for uh, our conversation, your input. I want to thank the audience for providing your questions. I want to thank the ITU, Dr. Uh, Chase Lee, uh, to, for his welcome remarks, but also very much the people in the back office who make this happen uh, on a technical level. Um, so we're going to go to the neural network to follow up with the audience uh, over there. And I'm going to hand over to Anna. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for participating in today's AI for Good session. We hope you've learned something new, innovative, and engaging in today's event. We now encourage you to continue the conversation on the live video wall in the neural network. Here you can ask questions, like and comment, share links, complete the poll, connect with interesting profiles, or speak one-on-one -on -one using the chat and video function. We invite you to explore the lobby, try the smart matching quiz, visit the virtual exhibits, poster boards, the eShop, and build your personalized AI for Good program. Let's shape the future of AI for Good.
Thank mm-hmm. you.